The weekly cybercrime and business podcast is brought to you by Surfwatch Labs. Surfwatch Labs delivers cyber risk intelligence solutions that help organizations understand the potential for cyber attacks, determine the impact to their business, and proactively address threats head on. Hey everybody out there, today is Friday, July 3rd, 2015. I'm Jeff Peters, Surfwatch Labs editor. I'm here with Matt Leifus, Surfwatch Labs writer, and Monica Schroeder, Surfwatch Labs data analyst. A little bit later, after our discussion and the latest cybercrime news, we'll have an interview with Jim Yeager. Jim is the chief cyber services strategist for Fidelis Cybersecurity, and they just put out a study on defining the gap, the cybersecurity governance survey, which takes a look at the attitudes of board members and IT professionals and sort of the gap that those two groups have. Yeah, so I guess I'll throw it over to you, Matt, for the top cyber headlines from the last week of Surfwatch Labs data. Yeah, sure thing. And coming in at number three, the number three top trending target according to Surfwatch Labs data was the United Nations Jordan website. The website was hacked by Anon Ghost. They defaced the web page. And they left Palestine supporting messages, which is kind of the trend, and that's what they do. Recently, a member, an unknown member of the hacktivist group participated in an interview, and they revealed the reason behind the attack was actually to kind of show the UN, United Nations, that they are protesting their lack of efforts regarding the limited support to stop Israel's war crimes against Palestine. Currently, the website's back up and functionally normally. Coming in at number two, and we're going to talk a little more at length about this later in the discussion, but the number two target was the Police Association of Ontario. The Canadian government's new anti-terrorism bill, which we'll talk about a little bit later, has caused a lot of protests. A lot of people aren't happy about it. And due to that, several government entities in Canada are kind of becoming targets uh, of cyber attacks. Recently, the Police Association of Ontario was attacked And some of their information was leaked online. It appears that Anonymous might be behind the attack. Uh, Some sources are saying it was Anonymous. Others, you know, they're saying there's a guy that was involved with Anonymous. We're not 100% sure. But a Twitter user that goes by the handle Rooted, that's R-O-0-T-E-D, he's been tweeting about this information about this breach all week long. And he actually has the hashtag to Anonymous, so he might be affiliated. We're not 100% sure. And coming in at number one, we have the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, or ATF. Uh, The Department of Justice announced an investigation against an executive uh, for ATF over improperly accessing and downloading personal information on employees. The executive in question is Scott Suito. He's the Deputy Assistant Director for Strategic Intelligence and Information for ATF. The investigation's ongoing. CNN, who originally kind of broke the story, uh, they reached out for Suito for comment, but he really wasn't very cooperative and kind of said, I don't share my personal information. Those are the top three turning targets for the week. And guys, I thought we could kind of kick it off right there. The ATF news kind of highlights a lot of stories that came in the news this week about insider activity and employees doing things that could potentially compromise the company or the employees that work for a company. Some other areas of news this week, we had the uh, Summit Financial Group. Members of the Summit Financial Group, if they got their tax returns done with the bank, uh, they received a CD with their tax return information on it, while an employee there accidentally put other customers' information on the CD, which obviously compromised their information. We had the Bank of Manhattan, uh, an employee mishandled some information there, putting it at risk. And then obviously this year, which we talked about in a former podcast, was the Woolworths Limited story. Customers were able to buy a Groupon coupon for like $100, $200, and they were to receive an electronic voucher from the store. While an employee for Woolworths accidentally emailed a master list of electronic vouchers worth a million dollars, and in the process actually compromised some of these customers' email addresses. A lot of employee and insider activity this week. And so one thing I wouldn't mind talking about is how can these types of activities really harm a business and what should they watch out for? 
Yeah, I think what's interesting to me is we're seeing a lot of more like accidental, you know, insiders, not necessarily malicious insider. We see a lot of that in the healthcare sector. Laptops get stolen or employees accidentally email in personal health information, things like that. So it's interesting this week that we saw some stories in the financial sector and then previously Woolworth in the consumer goods sector where employees were, you know, making those mistakes. So, I mean, obviously training employees is one thing, but I think, you know, kind of like we were talking, we interviewed um, someone from IBM probably beginning of the year on our podcast. And, you know, they were just talking about the shift a lot of businesses are doing towards focusing on the data. Obviously, if you're focusing on your data, you can kind of track and see if an employee, you know, is accidentally, you know, accessing way more data than they should. I agree with you, Jeff, about the healthcare sector and having a lot of accidental releases via that industry. But I think a lot of companies should start looking at backup systems like having like double checking when you're sending emails, double checking when you're attaching data, having two people, two eyes on um, information that's going out. Because I think in today's world, it's so easy to just copy and paste and then hit send and it's gone and you can't really get that back. Yeah, I think that's a good point, especially, you know, if you're sending out tax return information or sensitive information like that to definitely put some some double checks in place. Kind of going off some of the news you mentioned earlier, Matt, what I noticed this week was there was just a whole lot of hacktivist activity. I don't know if you guys are big fans of Canada, but July 1st was Canada Day. So, of course, Anonymous kind of took that and ran with it, and, you know, they've been doing hashtag anti-Canada Day. Um, And they were doing DDoS attacks. And this ties into this uh, controversial anti-terrorism bill, uh, C-51. And what that bill does is it amends over a dozen Canadian laws to permit government agencies to share information about individuals more easily. And it also broadens the mandate of the Canadian Security Intelligence Services. So some people are just worried about, you know, similar to the U.S., uh, the privacy implications going on in Canada. I read an interview with the website Cryptosphere. They they did an interview with some of the people behind the attack. They said there's a crew of about eight of them, and, and less than half of those are Canadian. The The group took credit for taking down the the main Canada site, the website of the Prime Minister's office, and other assorted high-profile targets, including domestic spy agency CSIS. So this group says they're not uh, involved in any database breaches. They said that's not their goal. They just want to basically raise awareness around around the, this privacy issue and this law. They said, quote, uh, we see DDoS attacks as legitimate protest." And they believe that those attacks should be legalized and you should be able to go ahead and schedule it like any other protest. I know we've talked with that about other people and obviously they hold a, a different view. You shouldn't just be able to you know, take someone's website down just because you disagree with them. I think the whole point of a protest is as long as it's peaceful. I guess through a protest you could argue that people are being bothered if you're standing outside their establishment yelling things, but you're not really... You're not really inhibiting or mitigating their ability to do their job. In a DDoS attack, you're clearly taking down a lot of network capabilities. So I, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I guess it would be peaceful. No one's getting hurt. But I, I don't really know if I agree with that. I don't think that DDoS attacks will ever be any sort of peaceful form of protest because it's you know inherently an attack. So I don't think that that will ever be something that that passes as a a legal thing. You could get your point across, though, I suppose. You know, you just shut someone down for a couple of days. You kind of get your point across. Yeah, but that could also, you know, especially if it's like an e-commerce site, I mean, you could potentially be costing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions in in damage, you know, in doing that. So it's one thing to say it's peaceful, but when you're costing that much money, and that's maybe not necessarily the case with some of these government sites, but, you know, in some situations it definitely applies. Uh, But one thing that was a little more disruptive on the hacktivist front, Team Ghost Shell is back. They were in the news back in 2012. Um, In 2012, they leaked a cache of more than 1 million user account records from 100 different websites. And this week they were back, and they claim they have a list of 548 websites, and they published a preview of the data that they breached from these various websites. And the preview shows things like leak names, email addresses, usernames, phone numbers, dates of birth, um, as well as some various passwords. 
It appears that the targets, those 548 targets, are seemingly random. Semantic, they, they put up a post about it, and they said that the group previously, this uh, ghost shell group, previously compromised databases by way of SQL injection attacks and poorly configured PHP scripts. However, it's unknown at this time how they uh, managed to compromise these 548 websites, or even if it's all legitimate, all this data that they're leaking. But just going off their track record, the, the experts that I've been reading are assuming that these attacks are legitimate and that the data that's being leaked is legitimate. So yeah, there's just been a lot of uh, hacktivist activity uh, this week that I noticed. And another thing I wrote, uh, just this morning I was working on a, an article about this Adobe Flash Zero Day. It was actually announced on June 23rd, but I thought that it was interesting just watching how this Zero Day developed because it was pretty similar to previous Zero Days we've seen from, from Flash. It was discovered on June 23rd, and just four days later, the vulnerability had made its way into the Magnitude Exploit Kit, and it was found um, being used to drop CryptoWall ransomware. And then over the past week, we've seen it spotted in a variety of other exploit kits like Angular, Nuclear, RIG, and, and Neutrino. So I think it was back in April where I read that FireEye researchers were, were saying that this is a really worrying trend for the security community, just in terms of the time that an exploit goes from a zero day, where it's you know specific targeted attack, to being put into one of these exploit kits that you know targets the masses you know, as a known exploit. So I just thought it was interesting this past week kind of seeing that obviously that trend is still underway because earlier this year, I think there was a seven-day gap in, in one of the uh, Adobe exploits, and then there was a three-day gap, and now this, this previous zero-day was just a four-day gap. So obviously it's more important than ever to update your software right away once these zero days are announced. I was reading uh, Brian Krebs's article on this, and he was asking um, sort of an important question, why keep this installed if you don't have to instead of just continually updating something one thing i've done a, a lot of the browsers you can set for example if you have like firefox or chrome you can set flash to click to play which is kind of nice because then basically if there's a, a flash ad or a flash video it just kind of puts a black box in there and then you have to click on the box in order to get the the thing to play so that keeps flash from just kind of loading randomly in all these sites so that's what i personally do there was a lot of uh, technical news like that, but there was also, I don't know if everyone's been following the Donald Trump presidency uh, this week. I don't know if you're a political fan, Matt. Have you been following the Donald Trump stuff? <laughs> well, I, I am a political fan, yeah. Um, I don't know how many people are saying Trump 216 at, uh, 2016 at this point, but uh, ever since ever since Donald Trump announced his presidency, he's 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 been having some bad luck. You know, number one, because of his... I wouldn't say luck. He kind of brought it on himself. Uh, he had some pretty racially insensitive comments, which some cable networks cut ties with them. But then recently in news, there was a payment card breach at Trump Hotels. So not a really good couple weeks for Donald Trump. And as a matter of fact, on the hotel data breach uh, front, according to the Surfwatch Labs May report, for the fourth consecutive month, there have been known payment breaches that involved hotels. So we're seeing this quite a bit. This will actually be the fifth consecutive month now that there's been a, a pretty significant breach at a hotel chain. So obviously, for especially for businesses who have people traveling to different hotels, um, I think that's one of the reasons hotels are a big target, especially like the, the more upper scale hotels. Uh, they want to get those, those credit cards with the, with the higher limits. But then also we've seen stories of you know, espionage going on in different places where people are installing uh, malware on you know, some of the public computers or with the Wi-Fi, things like that. So I think hotels in general are just something that you definitely need to make sure people in your business, if they're traveling, are aware of the dangers of various things on the front. And then it's particularly uh, just make sure you keep an eye on uh, the payment cards because we've seen so many point-of-sale breaches there recently. We can move on to our cyber tip of the week. The, the Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council, they just published a new version of its point-to-point -point encryption solution requirements and testing procedures. That's a mouthful to say. This standard is not mandatory for merchants or vendors, but it, it's meant as a complement to a PCI DSS. Version 2 basically um, uh, responds to some of the market feedback that they got from earlier adopters, and now with uh, point-to-point encryption version 2, 
merchants can have even more options for reducing risk and protecting customer data um, using encryption. So if you're concerned about some of these point of sale breaches, uh, you should definitely check that out. That is the point-to-point uh, the -point encryption solutions requirement and testing procedures. And we can put a link to that uh, in the podcast notes if you guys are interested in checking that out. Now we have an interview with Jim Yeager, the Chief Cyber Services Strategist at Fidelis Cybersecurity, and we talk about the gap between those in the boardroom and IT professionals. I guess my first question, Jim, is, is just recently Fidelis Cybersecurity and the Ponemon Institute uh, released their Defining the Gap, the Cybersecurity Governance Study. I saw a quote of yours, you said that, that effective cybersecurity governance is based on the principles of knowledge, visibility, and trust, and the challenges to balance those like a three-legged stool. And you concluded that this survey describes a pretty wobbly stool. So just is that kind of a good way to sum up the findings? Yes. Now, we really don't have data from previous years year to compare to, but the study certainly did show some gaps or differences in, in perspective between board members and IT security professionals, and, and certainly some gap is, is it would be natural and expected, but a few of these gaps look pretty significant, and in today's environment, defending against advanced cyber attacks, you really need a, a team and, and the board is part of that team along with the uh, cybersecurity professionals. They have unique roles, but they, they really need to be working together and in, in many cases sharing a fairly similar perspective of the cyber risk environment and uh, how to protect the organization. Yeah, I guess the most surprising stat to me reading through there was it said that 54% of IT security professionals reported a breach involving the theft of high-value information, such as like IP, within the last two years, but only 23% of board members reported the same. So just kind of looking at that, it seems to me like the board members are still fairly uninformed in a lot of cases. Yeah, that, that you're right. That is one of the more troubling disparities. It's also maybe one of the toughest ones to work on because clearly you don't want to inundate the board at their level with with a lot of data on daily activities and daily daily attacks. The challenge is to figure out what is significant and make sure that that gets to the board in in a way that they understand. But kind of returning to that statistic, certainly uh, any attack that involves the loss of high-value information you would think would warrant board-level attention. So the reporting processes here certainly need to be worked on. Just before we have on this call, I was chatting with one of my coworkers, and um, he's an IT guy, and he said that basically in every organization that he's ever worked in, the C-suite and the board of directors are sort of these mystical people that you see on the website but you never see in person or never get a chance to speak to. Did you guys come up with any conclusions? You know, what's the path going forward to help close this gap, assuming that that's the goal is to, to get them more on the same page? Yeah, so I, I'm going to take a step back just a bit. And, and uh, we really saw three gaps that we kind of dug out of uh, Dr. Poneman's findings. The first was a, a knowledge gap in specifically in the realm of cybersecurity, and, and that gap basically showed that while the boards review high-level cybersecurity policy, incident response plans, that type of thing, they, the boards themselves don't feel that they really have the expertise they need in that arena. So number one's an expertise gap. The second one is a visibility gap, which is the one that we just talked about in terms of board awareness of the security posture uh, of the organization at any given time to include breaches. 
And the third is is what we described as a trust gap between the cybersecurity professionals and, and uh, the board. So we think we need to work on all three of those gaps. And in conjunction with the Parman study, we did a white paper called Bridging the Gap and provide recommendations for each of those three areas. I'm just curious if you think maybe one of those three areas is of more concern than the others, or do you think they're kind of pretty equally weighted? I would say they're pretty equally uh, related. In fact, uh, I really like to use the analogy of a three-legged stool. You know, with a three-legged stool, if, if any one of those legs is either missing or significantly shorter than the other two, the stool's going to fall over. So I, I think you need all three. Although, to some extent, the, the trust gap is, is helped in many ways by bridging the knowledge gap and the visibility gap. You know, if you can work those two, they will in part help resolve the trust gap. But we also provide some recommendations on, on how to bridge that trust gap in and of itself as well. I, you know, I'd be happy to talk about those, some of those approaches. I would note that we also are now halfway through a four-part blog series where I go into detail, and as well as, as the uh, uh, white paper being available uh, uh, also. I assume going in, you guys probably had the assumption that there was a gap. Just wondering if like any of the stats or things that you guys asked about surprised you in any way, or if it was basically what you guys expected to, to find? I would say at this point, it, it is basically what we expected to find. The breaches in the past year, many of the high-profile breaches in the past year, like Sony, like Target, Home Depot, you know, they, they now really have the board's attention, but you can't solve a lot of this in terms of the knowledge or visibility, uh, you can't solve it overnight. So we did expect to see see some of these gaps. And in fact, I, I've been working with some uh, several boards specifically in, in this regard. Yeah, just curious if you could maybe like elaborate on that, just in terms of what like steps maybe a business needs to do or an enterprise if they're you know concerned about this, these findings. Probably the simplest is just to kind of walk through each of the gaps. Uh, in terms of the, the knowledge gap, there's two basic ways to uh, address that. One is to actually add board members who have cybersecurity background. Now, that's not always easy, in part because many boards have unique requirements, you know, to become members of the board that may involve some investment in the firm or, or that type of thing. And certainly they need, board members need uh, expertise in the industry that, that uh, the organization is in. But short of actually adding uh, board members or replacing board members to gain the cyber, cyber experience, boards can use outside advisors, in some cases uh, law firms, or advisory firms in many cases have cyber expertise that they can they can assist the boards uh, with that expertise. The other area, the other approach is to include cybersecurity as a regular agenda item. And and some of those sessions may be more educational, you know, than necessarily dealing with immediate immediate issues. I would recommend that both for the whichever committee, uh, usually the risk committee or the audit committee are the ones charged with uh, cybersecurity responsibility. I, I would recommend that that's where you bring in either outside advisors or or hire a board member for those committees. Uh, but they both the the committees and the board as a whole ought to have cybersecurity as a regular uh, agenda item. And 
frankly, uh, some of those presentations are probably outside presentations, but many of them should be coming from the IT professional staff. And again, that's one way to bridge the gap that the individual that you were talking to noted that you know he he never sees or or interfaces with the uh, the C suite or the board. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much all the questions that I have. Unless there's anything else you wanted to touch on. No, I would just just note that I think this will be a hot topic for uh, a number of years. You know, we are seeing so many breaches that are not detected in many cases by the uh, the organization itself, but but that are tipped off by law enforcement or someone outside the organization monitoring data on the dark web or, or that type of thing. So until we get our, our security, cybersecurity postures back to where organizations are are fairly quickly detecting and, and countering breaches, we're going to continue to, continue to see these highly visible, highly damaging attacks, and, and that will, will keep it a, a board-level topic. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time today, Jim. We appreciate it. Thanks for taking an interest in the study. Thanks for listening to this week's Cybercrime and Business Podcast. As always, you can find us on iTunes, YouTube, and all the major podcasting sites. And for more information, check out surfwatchlabs.com.